Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to our second lecture in this lecture series on queer theology. Um, tonight, we have the wonderful Hannah. I'm not going to say very much about her because I think she's going to cover it in her talk, except to say that she's my friend and she's fabulous and she'll have some amazing things to say. So there'll be about 40 minutes of talking and then there'll be time for some questions after that. Yeah. <laughs> First, a huge thank you to Father Lee and all of you for the invitation to speak to you today. And for those who haven't had a chance to chat to you over coffee and things yet, um, just a couple of things about me that might put this talk into a little bit of context for you. So I serve as the assistant priest at the University Church in Oxford. I'm also on the reference group for the LGBTI plus chaplaincy team in the Diocese of Oxford. I'm one of the ecumenical management group for the city's first trans and gender non-conforming outreach workers. And just before the pandemic, I was also one of a small team uh, with my husband, Liam, who's here tonight, um, of queer Christians and allies who started Sacred, which is a monthly safe space for queer people, especially those who are coming from more evangelical and conservative backgrounds, to worship at Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford. I'm also a vocations advisor, which is essentially someone who helps other people to work out what the hell God wants them to do with their lives. Um, but it's really interesting, and I tell you these things because with the exception of vocations advisors who have been around for a bit longer, it's really only been the last sort of three to five years that any of those posts would have been possible, let alone centrally supported by the church and by the diocese. I'm really lucky that I minister in a diocese where as a bi and genderqueer woman, I know that my bishop has my back and where I can not only be free to be me in ministry, but I also have the encouragement, support and financial commitment of senior colleagues to help me help other people be released into who they are and what God really wants them to do with their lives, what God has called them to be and to do. I don't know if any of you have seen on social media, but today my bishop has just published his own personal contribution to the Living in Love and Faith conversations that the Church of England have been having around human sexuality and gender. And his is, I think it's fair to say, a very positive and significant voice in affirmation of the holiness of queer lives and relationships. But the affirming senior leaders of the C of E and the other cishet allies and theologians which have started opening those incredible doors for queer people at an institutional level are doing so, as many of them rightly acknowledge, while standing on the shoulders of invisible giants. And it's this group of invisible giants of our faith that I want to talk a little bit about tonight. We have, of course, just celebrated All Saints Day in the liturgical calendar. And it's my hope, and perhaps my next Twitter campaign, that one day we will have some of those currently unrecognized giants of the fight for LGBTQIA plus justice in the church recognized as saints whose feast days we mark and whose lives we look up to as an example of great holiness, devotion and determination. It's slow, but the church is changing. We are certainly not there yet, but there is hope and there is movement. But that in itself can be a challenging place to be because it means that we are living in in-between times. Christians, of course, are pretty used to living in in-between times and that certainly gives us a sense of perspective about the world but it doesn't necessarily make it any easier emotionally to inhabit that space. It just means we're better practiced at it than some. 
at the moment in the Church of England, we are in between the last few weeks of one liturgical year, culminating in the Feast of Christ the King, and the beginning of another, which starts on Advent Sunday. We are in between the hope of resurrection, which we profess in the creed, and the despair of war and death, which we see on the news and we witness especially among the experience of the Ukrainian people who are seeking refuge across Europe and on our shores. We are in between the end of COVID restrictions and yet hundreds of people are still dying from the virus in the UK. We are in between Christ having inaugurated the kingdom and it finally coming on earth as it is in heaven. We are in between worlds. And boy, don't we know it. And for those of us who are queer, and as a side note, I just use that term as a kind of catch-all for the LGBTQIA plus community. So for those of us who are queer, and also in the dear old Church of England particularly, we're living in between the blatant ignorance and various phobias expressed in the document Issues in Human Sexuality and the process of living in love and faith, which is only just now coming to the point where we move from endless and sometimes quite damaging conversation to a point where the House of Bishops will consider some recommendations to put before the Synod about the way forward. And we're in between church and state. We have pride and equal marriage, but not in church yet. It's exhausting, isn't it, being in between, constantly standing between two worlds, being an advocate and apologist, but also being an onlooker and sometimes an excuse maker for the church you love to the people you love. I love the church, she's my life, but she infuriates me because no matter how hard I try, I can't stop loving her, even when she's being utterly unreasonable. I, of course, am an ordained priest in the church. I didn't want to be, in fact, I was literally planning my escape as I walked from the vestry to the altar of the church where I was to be priested, but that's a story for another time. Maybe ask me about that over a glass of something afterwards and I can give you all the gory details. But here I am, and I love it, and I'm called to it, and I would never be or do anything else. And I remain joyfully terrified of the responsibility that comes with it. But before I talk a little bit more about priestly calling and why it feels like a big responsibility to me, I just want to put you on the spot for a moment and ask you a question. What does it mean to be priestly? Not what is an ordained priest, but what does it mean to be priestly? What does priestly character look like when you see it? So we're just going to have a couple of minutes to turn to the person you're next to or to a couple of people around you and maybe just share your initial response to that question. I know you thought you were coming to listen to somebody else and I'm making you do the work, but if you'd indulge me for a minute, just, just have a think about that question. What does it mean to be priestly? And I will yell or wave my hand when it's, when it's time to come back. What does it mean to be priestly? Anyone in a dog collar is not allowed to answer that first. <laughs> oh, just to turn that one. Just to turn that one. And if 
you're next to someone and you haven't had chance to swap over, don't miss the opportunity to give your little bit of theological input. What does it mean to be priestly? I'm not going to call out any heresies, don't worry. <laughs> if anybody wants to, uh, if particularly anybody not in a dog collar or a position of pastoring a church, if anybody wants to kind of volunteer, what, what do you think um, it means to be priestly? In somebody else's shoes. I said, uh, to have the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, to be compassionate, and if you come across someone with whom you profoundly disagree with their views, mm or they were thinking, you still have the ability to love them and help them, and also to obviously think of others before yourself, maybe. That's such a lovely kind of example, actually, of, um, of yeah, that, that sense of being able to put yourself into somebody else's shoes, even if you really disagree with them, to be able to love them and have compassion towards them. Um, and, and that sense of, of empathy that comes with that. And that's certainly the core of uh, a pastoral ministry that, that priests have. Thank you for sharing that. Does anyone else want to share what they think? What does, what does being priestly look like to you? Well, it must be a particularly Christian requirement. Sorry. An imam, in that sense, would be priestly within his faith. Same with Hindus or Muslims. Um, other faiths, Buddhists, they have their leaders. That's they really have to have priestly qualities as we would define them. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because that transcendent nature of a core kind of function of priesthood within a community um, it sounds like some of the thing that you're getting at, that it's not necessarily just a kind of Christian quality, as it were, but actually it's something that, other, that people of other faiths could exercise within their context. Leadership within faith. Yeah. Leadership, yeah. Leadership is a word that, particularly at the moment in the Church of England, mm -hmm. that's something that, that there's some kind of wrestling with. What does, what does priestly leadership look like, particularly when you're having to manage big buildings that are often falling down. <laughs> um, and, but you're also called to do that kind of pastoral work and the more kind of um, intimate one-to-one -one type um, work of a priest as well with, with the flock that you're pastoring. Um, so thank you, that's really helpful. Anybody else? I love the way that you've captured that about embodying what you believe and representing that to others. And that's something I think we're, we're going to explore a little bit more in just a moment. Is there anybody else that, that wants to kind of, just before we finish yeah, the thing? I think you've totally nailed it, and I think we should all go home. <laughs> no, that's absolutely brilliant. Seriously, that's um, that's kind of where we're going next, actually. But that representative function um, and holding the people before God and God before the people, um, and that's the same for me, really, as to, as to how I see that. So, for me, being priestly is to take on that responsibility, and it's a heavy, but it's a joyful responsibility of representative ministry. To be an ordained priest, certainly an ordained priest in the Church of England, is to do that in a particular way through the public sacramental life and to take leadership, as we've talked about, leadership responsibility for pastoring people, for leading worship, 
helping people interpret the word of God and helping them in their discipleship and vocational growth as well. But as we've just identified here tonight, being priestly in character and in function doesn't just belong to the ordained priesthood. Being priestly is the call of simultaneously listening in two directions. As we've just heard of holding the people before God and holding God before the people. And remembering that the ordained priesthood doesn't just exist in isolation, but it's an expression and an enabler of the priesthood of all the church. I come from the Church of England, and the Church of England's ordinal, the common worship version, the ordinal, the charge, if you like, for priests, says this about priestliness. God calls his people to follow Christ and forms us into a royal priesthood, a holy nation, to declare the wonderful deeds of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. The church is the body of Christ, the people of God, and the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. In baptism, the whole church is summoned to witness to God's love and to work for the coming of his kingdom. To serve this royal priesthood, God has given particular ministries. Priests are ordained to lead God's people in the offering of praise and the proclamation of the gospel. They share with the bishop in the oversight of the church, delighting in its beauty and rejoicing in its well-being. They are to set the example of the good shepherd always before them as the pattern of their calling. With the bishop and their fellow presbyters, they are to sustain the community of the faithful by the ministry of word and sacrament, that we all may grow into the fullness of Christ and be a living sacrifice acceptable to God. <sighs> Blimey. <laughs> it's quite a task, isn't it? But let's just take that opening phrase, which comes originally, it's derived originally from 1 Peter. God calls his people to follow Christ and forms us into a royal priesthood, a holy nation, to declare the wonderful deeds of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. This, I believe, is what it is to be priestly. Firstly, we are called to follow Christ. We cannot lead anybody else until we follow the leader ourselves. Secondly, we are called to be formed into that royal priesthood. Following Jesus is a relationship which changes us, not only for our own sake and salvation, but for the sake of the world. And thirdly, we are called to declare God's wonderful deeds. We have good news to share, and it's to no one's benefit <coughs> if we keep it to ourselves. We'll talk a little bit more in a moment about being formed for priestly ministry, but just take those three things for now. Being called to follow, being called to be formed, and being called to declare. And just in your own mind, reflect on that question I asked a moment ago about what does it mean to be priestly, and the answers that we've heard to that. Would you change your answer in response, thinking about those things, to follow, to be formed, and to declare? But more importantly, do you recognise that calling in yourself? Do you recognise, not necessarily to be an ordained priest in the Church of England, though there may be those out there who are pursuing that, not putting on a chasuble on a Sunday and presiding at the Eucharist or administering last rites, but are you being called to be part of God's priestly people, to follow Jesus, to let yourself and your world be changed through relationship with him, and to proclaim that there is still hope to be found in this world. If you are baptised, then whether you like it or not, this is your mission. <laughs> and it is your calling. You are part already of the priestly people of God, called to help bring light into the dark places of the world, to bring God to the people you meet through your words and actions and compassion, and to bring the people and places in need before our loving God. 
So while I leave you to consider your own priestly calling for a moment, I'm going to just delve a little bit deeper into the second of those callings about how we are formed for priestly ministry, be that as part of the priestly people of God or as an ordained representative in the church. Now, when they did finally catch me and stick a collar around my neck, I'm lucky that I got given three years of theological college and four years of curacy to begin to form and shape me for that particular task. Although there is one more less conventional place that I was being formed for priesthood long before I ever went to vicar school. And that was in the fledgling online forums of the LGBTQI plus community of the early noughties. In the anxiety-laden edges of the dial-up internet with that terrible sound, I'm going to divide the room here now. <laughs> Hands up those that remember the terrible sound of the internet. <laughs> I'm not quite as old as I thought I was. <laughs> and for those of you who don't, uh, don't even Google it, it's awful. <laughs> and very long. Yeah, yes, yeah. But in those kind of anxiety-laden edges of the internet, I found myself between two worlds again. I found myself between the cishet world of everywhere on the map except for Soho, it seemed at the time, <laughs> and between that and the dark, deep corners of queer culture behind avatars and cryptic screen names. And it was in those spaces that I first learned how to represent. And I quickly learned to speak two different languages into two very different spheres. I go to church on a Sunday morning and confess my commenting on the Gay Youth UK forum from Saturday evening, but I'd also spend Sunday evening back there speaking to burned out, bruised and broken teens whose faith had been pulled so tight across the apparently intraversible chasm that their guide rope had given way and their belief in God and usually also their mental health was now hanging by a thread. I lived in between being out online and having a whole identity built around this subculture and being very much not out in the analog world of home and church and school at the time. I had a foot in both worlds. And without knowing it, I was learning to be a deacon, seeking out those lost sheep. And I was also learning to be a priest, shepherding those sheep, because the rest of the church didn't seem to want to. But what I came to realise too was that I was not by any means alone in this task. There was a subgroup of my subculture who had been doing this work far longer than I. This group were the queer Christians the ones who somehow held on to faith as strangers in the farthest reaches of the internet, all while coping with their own journeys of self-discovery and faith-stretching life events and relationships too. And they were people who witnessed quietly as well as out loud to their own churches by resolutely refusing to accept that they were not lovable who shook off the dust of unwelcoming congregations and shook up the leadership of unreformed theological spaces. These were the people who were priest, prophet and pioneer long before it was trendy, setting up their own fresh expressions unfunded by the church. Not because it was some novel way to build the kingdom, but because no one else would have them. These are the invisible giants of faith in our generation. These are the saints unrecognised. And these were the priestly people of God in coats of many colours who fought for all to have a place at the table of the king. Day by day, these queer Christians sat at the weeping spaces and the gravesides of teens who, just like them, had been struggling with their sexuality, some of whom who had sadly taken their lives because of the hate they experienced. 
and these queer Christians stubbornly refused to let evil triumph. So they sat and they cried for queer souls and they marched with placards and candles on streets and on synods until change slowly started to happen. These were the priests who danced because God commanded it, not because they felt like it. And they danced for those who had been trampled by unjust systems, unkind teachers, uneducated youth pastors, and unrepentant Section 28 supporters. But when they came out with their flags and their costumes in the great procession from the sanctuary of the internet and the gay bars out into the streets of our cities, they truly were a royal priesthood, a holy nation showing forth the glory of him who had called them out of darkness into his marvellous light. What could be more priestly than standing in the face of darkness and prejudice and pointing to the light of Christ. The church may not have recognised it at the time, but by God were they called, and by his grace they were faithful. How many lives, I wonder, have been saved by their witness? How many lives have been saved by the ministry of other queer Christians? I know mine has. These invisible giants on whose shoulders we stand today responded to God's call, often at incredible personal cost, in order to play their part in sharing the saving love of God with both the broken and the powerful. These queer Christians were called out from both communities to stand in the in-between spaces between those two worlds which in many ways <coughs> seemed opposed to one another. And salvation history through the Old Testament, first of all, shows a clear pattern and correlation between holiness and the calling of these kinds of ministerial representatives. The one is called and set apart for the sake of the whole. Individuals are called to bathe in the presence of God so that they can then communicate God's word to others. Moses, if you'll pardon the forthcoming pun, is just one shining example. <laughs> but then it's also a small group or tribe who are called to distinctive holiness for the sake of the nation, to call them back to God and to a pattern of holy living or to perform a particular function. Take the Levitical priesthood, for example. And then there's the nation who are called for the sake of the world, such as the people of Israel, God's chosen people who are called to show what life can be like when God dwells in their midst and they recognise and shape their lives around God's presence. But then we reach the New Testament and Mary, behind me, is called out to be the God-bearer and the twelve are called to be disciples and later apostles. And then by the gift of the Spirit, even the Gentiles become holy and witness to God's unfathomable love to all the ends of the earth, as Jesus commanded them. And as an aside here, I wonder if, does anybody recall that story of Peter's vision of the sheet of four corners containing all those unclean animals? And the thing that God says to Peter is get up and eat. And Peter says to God, no, no, I can't do that, I'm a holy man. <laughs> I don't eat or associate with unclean things. But God commands him to get up and eat. And he tells him, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. A lot of what we think holiness is about is purity. But actually holiness is a gift and a way of life, of allowing ourselves to show the transforming power of God working in us. Holiness is not so much about ritual purity. It's about purpose, about being called for the sake of the whole. 
what God has made clean, you must not call profane. And that's the phrase that completely changed my life and perspective on whether I as a queer person might be called to ordain ministry. I thought I wasn't holy enough and I never could be because from the particular church culture that I came from, being queer was like having an impurity that would never leave you. But like the mission to the Gentiles and Peter, ba Peter then baptizing the household of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, after he'd had that vision, whatever the church has historically considered queerness to be, I believe that because of that vision and revelation in it, queerness isn't a barrier to our calling to be a priestly people of God. So now as we hear in the ordinal, which I read a section from earlier, and 1 Peter, it's our turn to be called out for the sake of the whole. Because this mission is now for all the baptised, as we wait for Christ's return and the consummation of heaven and earth, God calls us to declare his saving love without discrimination. And I believe it because I've seen it, and I've also now been it, that God is calling queer Christians like never before to step into their baptismal priesthoods and walk between the world of the church and the world of queer culture, resolutely refusing to exclude anyone from either. I mentioned earlier that I've been a vocations advisor since I think about 2019, um, and I've seen a grand total now of two cishet people exploring their vocation. All the rest, and there have been a number of them, all the rest, completely unbeknownst to those who have sent them to me, have been queer. Whether you like it or not, we're everywhere. <laughs> and if you ever have any doubt that queer Christians are at the forefront of the renewal of the Church of England, then trust me, God is calling us by the tongue to be and to change his church to make it more kingdom-shaped. But of course, I'm not just talking here about those exploring vocation to ordain ministry. I'm talking about queer people fulfilling their calling as parts of that priesthood of all believers to speak to and from and within the church and to speak to and from and within queer spaces, to bring the two together in the kind of queer and quirky marriage that only God can make possible. Personally, I've never really belonged in either world. I don't look queer enough for one, and I'm certainly not straight enough for the other. <laughs> but I found my place, and I know where I belong for this life at least, walking between those two worlds and representing one to the other, encouraging dialogue between them and bringing the intercessions of queer people who have been broken by the weight of conformity before the God who can heal them and fix the deadly faults in the systems that hurt them. But for all we fulfil as a priestly nation of queer Christians out in this world, I would not want you to go away thinking that this was your work alone. You are called to be you, not God. Priesthood does of course require sacrifice, but it should not be you laid out on that altar or pinned to the cross in the process. We have a saviour already. And this is where the institution of the church must be especially careful in this process, particularly of the living in love and faith process, not to make queer Christians into sacrificial lambs whose blood and tears and private lives are spilled in the name of progress. There are times for every priest when we are broken and we need the ministry of others, and it is no different for the priestly people of God, perhaps especially so for priestly ministry of queer Christians. There are times that you will get blistered feet from climbing over all the obstacles that the church will put in your way. And there are times that you will have aching arms 
from holding on to souls who are pulled in unbearably different directions. Every priestly Christian needs time to rest, and you are allowed to take a Sabbath from your priestly work, even from the fight for justice, if you need to, because it is not ultimately your work, it is God's. And we have a Saviour who knows better than any of us what it is like to walk between worlds. Jesus knows what it is to suffer the cruelty of humanity. He knows what it's like to be rejected by religious institution. He knows the cost of a holiness which is misunderstood and which terrified others so much that they tried to suppress it. That is why Jesus is our great high priest. Not only because he is God, but because he is human and he gets it. Our priesthood as queer Christians is a work of standing between worlds with Jesus and pointing the hurting, beautiful human souls to him for their transformation and divine healing. I don't know what, if anything, you might take away from this rambling of mine about queerness and priesthoods, but when you do leave here tonight, what I want you to go out knowing is that your queerness is not a barrier to your vocation or to God's mission in this world. It is an integral part of who you are called to be in God's kingdom. So have confidence to inhabit the in-between spaces of this world and trust in your hard-won expertise and the hard-won expertise of the queer community to navigate them. But most of all, trust in God who has called you out of the darkness of the closet into his marvellous light. Because God delights in you. God delights in your queerness and in his church. And you might be just exactly the priest that his people need right now to help bring those two worlds to holier, better, and more fruitful conversation. Thank you. So we've, we've got about 10, ten minutes for questions. If anybody's got some questions, then I'll, yep. I'll hand back up to Hannah. <laughs> I wish I had a crystal ball that could see into the future. Um, do you know what? I take such encouragement, such encouragement from uh, my own bishop. I feel really lucky <laughs> with all our bishops in the Diocese of Oxford. Um, but, but I take such encouragement that actually, you know, as one of the kind of first movers, certainly in the diocesan kind of reflections on that living in love and faith process, that, that he is somebody who has come from a um, more kind of conservative evangelical background, has said do you know what? I was wrong. I thought this way once, and I've been on a journey, and he says at the end of, um, I, don't, I don't want to kind of issue, I probably ought to issue a spoiler alert for the, by the booklet, it's great, um, but, but actually, you know, he says, like, this is what I believe the Spirit is saying to the church. Um, you know, I've, um, you know, I'm not bishop, but I've been on a similar journey myself, as I shared a little bit with you, um, from that more conservative evangelical background, um, I also discovered I love like candles and incense, so you know, um, I moved a bit in the, in terms of my spirituality. But actually, um, you know, the treasures of that tradition are that we really deeply engage with and interrogate scripture and look at our, the kind of lenses that we look through, or that our particular kind of hermeneutic, as we call it, that that we look 
at texts with, and we we use, particularly as queer people, we're used to challenging ourselves and our assumptions about the world because everybody else out there at one stage seemed to think we were wrong. Um, so actually, we're really good at that self-reflection. But I'm really encouraged to see that um, some of the more um, kind of traditional positions on human sexuality, some of those that hold that in the church, have also been willing to do that work of self-reflection um, and theological reflection within their communities. I hope and I trust that there is a will for change um, that's the impression that I get from the conversations that I've had with people, but, um, I mean, goodness knows, well, God, no, God does know. Um, it will come, it will happen, um, hopefully it will happen soon, um, that, that we can properly bless and affirm, um, people and, and their loving, faithful covenant relationships too. So, thank you. It seems like one of the big issues at the moment, the fact that the Anglican community is worldwide. Mm. Um, and it's all very well with bishops within the Church of England um, saying uh, progress towards uh, equality, but you've got an enormous number of uh, Anglican communities, particularly in Africa, mm. uh, that will be pushing against that all the time. Yeah. And you know, obviously the leadership within the Church in this country, because of its leadership role within the Anglican necessarily has to take their views into account as well. Yeah. And this is going to be a continuing issue, obviously, for many years. I just wondered whether you wanted to comment on that. Mm. I, um, I, mean, I wouldn't <laughs> want to be a bishop anywhere at the minute, <laughs> or probably ever. But, um, but actually, that because that impossible task of working out, what does unity look like mm -hmm. when there is difference? Um, and we should be able to delight in our difference. Mm. Um, and we, uh, you know, we, there are incredible gifts. You look at the Lambeth, the Lambeth Conference, which, contrary to what the papers might say, was not all about sex. Um, it was just partly about those kind of issues. But, um, but actually the gifts that people from, you know, kind of different backgrounds and cultures and, um, and world experiences were able to bring to one another and share will hopefully have kind of informed the way that we do theology as a community, a global community together. Um, but saying that, I think, you know, Archbishop Justin kind of hit, hit the nail on the head really with it when he said, he just named the fact that we have different opinions. Uh, we have different theologies which we hold with integrity. You know, we're actually, we're all seeking after Christ and after truth. Um, and we know that whilst there is truth, there is also context to how that truth lands. Um, and, you know, I... I, there is not a single voice on this issue. I don't think we can just say, kind of, Africa has this view. Um, and I know that wasn't what you were saying, but I think there is a tendency for us to get quite reductionist when we're talking about this. Um, there, I know there have been some, some fruitful conversations between actually the, the, and she's shared this publicly, so I feel that I can kind of recount it, but between a um, Nigerian bishop, I believe, who was visiting, um, and the um, trans outreach worker in, in Oxford, a very kind of spirit-filled conversation um, where he is doing a lot of advocacy work for the LGBT com community um, that he serves. And yeah, really just, we're all in different places with this and we all have different lived experiences and we all carry different um, kind of baggage and prejudices and challenges that we face and the way that we navigate those in a holy way as a community is what will ultimately show the love of Christ. Um, there are people who are going to be suffering all over the world as they are in the UK because there is this particular view which diminishes the humanity of, of those who are LGBTQI+. Um, but actually, we are on a journey together. Um, and if we don't keep that conversation open, mm -hmm. then we'll never be able to share the wisdom and we'll, we'll never truly be able to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Can you um, just say something? Mm. Uh, you may not like what I'm going to say, eh? but I believe, you know, I always said what you're saying, what I heard tonight, but mm. I think what has caused a lot of damage to your cause has been gay pride, because in gay pride, people are under the assumption that it's a gathering of promiscuous people. I'm, I'm saying you're yeah. on your side then. Do you know what? I, you know yeah, saying? that's a really interesting observation because actually, so one of the things I struggled with when I first became, um, when I first became a queer, that's not right, I was always queer, <laughs> uh, when I first kind of came out 
and, and owned up to the fact that I was a mistake player. Sometimes it's more scary to admit you're Christian than it is to admit you're queer. Um, but, but that was one of the things I struggled with. I'm like, um, who is it? Uh, is it Hannah Gatsby that says, where, where did all the quiet gays go? <laughs> and that, do you know what? That's me. That's me wanting yeah. to be sat there with a cup of tea going, oh, it's terribly colourful. I'm not sure I can deal with it. But um, you know, I'm, I'm also coming out tonight as an introvert. Um, <laughs> however, um, but actually... Do you know what, ha what I reacted against was the fact that when you push a community underground through your prejudice, mm. they become unregulated. They're, it's not in the light, it's not out in the light. And there are some amazing things about queer culture from like you know the 90s and noughties and whatever when I was growing up through that. Um, but there were also some really deeply damaging, um, unfortunately some stereotypes that had been true at times in certain areas of that community but by no means are true across the board. And I think that's the problem is that, you know, the media love a sensation, don't they? Um, and you look at like the, the kind of AIDS crisis of the 80s and the way that that was portrayed and the way that queer people were demonized because of that. Um, and it's actually completely unfair representation. Yeah, I agree, but when you reach, I've, you know, I've mixed with a lot of gay people in France because my sister was in show business, so I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> yes, darling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But and when we first had gay pride, for some reason I couldn't go. I wanted to go because I was, I had met people who worked with Christian Don Dior, gay people who made beautiful costumes. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was looking forward to it because I thought, there's going to be all these amazing costumes, you know. I was, and when I saw the pictures in the Argus, I couldn't believe it. I just thought it was so awful. I mean, I, I can't even repeat what the Argus printed. It was awful. Yeah. And I thought that didn't help your cause, unfortunately. Yeah, do you know and what? People, if you yeah. said that, the, the gay community gets very annoyed. But it's the truth. If you speak, people won't say to you, I'm telling you to your face, eh? But yeah, no, that other people won't say this to you. It's they will helpful say it to hear, the scene. but if I can just respond yeah. as the current representative of all the queer community for our <laughs> time, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, of course, in every culture, there are corners of it that are unhealthy. And the, one of the problems with, um, I think, queer culture through the ages, and this is something that I think we've, this is why we've got to battle against this and against the prejudice that we face. It's because, as I've said already, if, when you push something underground, it's not out in the light. It's not open to scrutiny. It's not, you know, and, and if you continuously kind of demonize people in the media and whatever else, they're not able to share the positive story um, and actually show you what faithful, loving, you know, relationships that aren't heteronormative look like. And the thing is about, particularly, and just move, kind of moving away from the general point, but the Church of England, the Church of England kind of, um, hasn't realised it's been ordaining and marrying uh, people who don't share the same gender identity as they present with. Um, you know, I might lose my job, but I'm one of them. You know, and actually, <laughs> I know that, um, you know, but what we term biological sex is obviously much more complex um, than what it appears on the surface. But in terms of kind of, uh, you know, our, our gender identity and the way that, that we are able to develop in relationship with one another, Surely the more important thing and the good and positive story that we have to tell, the godly story that we have to tell, is what faithfulness looks like, what covenant looks like in relationship. You know, that's what marriage, I think whether it, people perceive it always has been or not, but that's what marriage as one expression of fruitful relationship with God and the church should look like, is that covenant relationship that shows God's and life and love. Um, anyway, I'm off on another sermon. <laughs> Do we have time for one more? Time for probably a couple more. Fantastic. Uh, talking about taking the church aside, how do you feel that gay people should express themselves and to become happy within themselves if they have no interest in the church? If they have no interest in the church? Well, I think, you know, God is outside the church as well as within it. And I think, well, that's the thing. We don't have to be interested in God for God to be interested in us. And God desires our flourishing, whoever we are, wherever we find ourselves, whether, whether we, you know, we recognize God or not. Actually, you know, I'm a, I'm a strong subscriber to the God is love and those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. That actually, 
those who are seeking after love, those who are seeking after light, those who are seeking after something bigger than themselves that perhaps the church has not done itself a great favour in the way it's packaged it to them. Um, actually, do you know what? Their soul's pointing in the right direction. Um, and I think, you know, we see God blesses all sorts of people and situations in the world that the church is not directly involved in. And of course, I would love everybody to know that that love and that light has a name, and that name is Jesus, and to have that personal relationship um, that I believe, you know, brings great fruitfulness to our lives. Um, but also, I recognise that the church, again, has not been its own, it's been its own worst enemy in terms of PR at times. Um, and so there are people who we have turned away. They've sought gods, and we've turned away by our kind of messaging and, and all of that. And actually, the church needs to repent of that. And I hope that certainly within the Church of England, at least, I mean, I can't speak for the whole church. Um, here I am professing to speak for the whole Church of England. <laughs> but, but, um, but hey, you asked the question. But the, church, but, but, but the Church of England, at least, will now begin that process of repentance. And repentance is a process. Um, it's about returning, about changing our direction. Um, and facing towards God and away from the things that we have been facing and invested in that aren't healthy and don't enable people to flourish. Um, and I really hope that that message will get out to the world outside the church because most people, I mean, different denominations, of course, may or may not have heard of the kind of Church of England's processes and journeys with this, but certainly people outside the church generally, um, most of them, like, they have no clue and they don't see the relevance of this. I work with a lot of students and, um, you know, one-to-one -one some of them uh, share sort of negative experiences of churches, but, but actually a lot of the conversations that, that I have with students, they just assume the church must be affirming and inclusive now um, because everybody else is, and that's a good thing in society, so why wouldn't the church recognise that? Um, so, yeah, I God's out there to I be discovered. I think the big problem with the young who have no idea about God or... or the love of God. Yeah. That's why Hannah's and not that's the university yeah. church. Yeah. <laughs> that's what she does so well. But that is your job. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's our job as, as well. Yeah, yeah, don't let them off the hook. Not all on Hannah. Yeah, yeah, please, I've got do, enough to do. Do you want to do one if, more? Have you seen my email inbox? I've got enough going on. But, but actually, on a serious note, that's kind of what this is about. You, as queer Christians and allies, that's your job to spread the love um, in, in the world, not just kind of, you know, in the church, but out there in the world. So thank you for that. One more. Um, so it's a question about how much um, queerness is actually integral to, to faith, which I, I think it probably is. And the, the question is coming from, okay, it's a brief story. When I was uh, 10 or 11 years old, I, I, um, I believed in God. And I read um, The Lord of the Rings for the first time. <laughs> and, um, and I was so captivated by the story when I reached the end of the book, I prayed, and I remember praying to God, saying, um, oh, I felt so just devastated, and if this can somehow be real, I pray that it be real. And many years later, when I was 21, I, I had an encounter with Christ, and I realized that the story of the Lord of the Rings was in some sense true, but it's a great sort of analogy of the journey of faith in one sense. And I was reading it recently, and um, in the first chapter, it describes basically Frodo and Bilbo as being queer. Um, and the reason they're queer is because they had an aspect of their spirit which is different to the other hobbits who get very caught up with local kind of things and local concerns <laughs> and never see a bigger kind of picture. Mm -hmm. um, but they've got this kind of took part to their, their nature that makes them different. And, 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 and Tolkien uses the word queer. And I'm wondering how much people of faith can learn from queerness mm -hmm. and how integral being queer, not just sexually, but being queer, not fitting, seeing a bigger picture, searching for something that is not just found within you know, one's kind of known life could actually, you know, that, that, that we can somehow marry those two things together as queerness and And I think what you've so beautifully and eloquently described is kingdom vision. Mm. 
Um, and, and there is a lot that the sort of cishet church, or at least the apparently cishet church, um, we're, as I said, we're everywhere. Um, maybe it's all the quiet gays in church. Anyway, um, but yeah, but actually there is a lot that the kind of presenting cishet church can learn from queerness, that curiosity of spirit, that something different. You know, aren't we all as Christians searching after something different? We've noticed, we've seen something in the world. We've seen something beyond what our immediate experience is. And we're desperate to find out more. And that curiosity, despite all the obstacles that we face, that we face from the world, that we face from the church, that we face from within ourselves, and my goodness, I'm a big advocate for therapy. Um, but actually, you know, despite all that, there's a tenacity about queer people um, and, and a kind of queerness of spirit. Um, and I think I'd like to write a book with you on that. <laughs> there's so much to explore. Um, but yeah, next time, next time. Anyway, we probably ought to yeah, wrap up before brilliant. I fall. Thank you very much, Anna. <laughs> I told you she was fabulous. Thank you, everybody. Um, next month is Lyndon Webb coming to speak to us about the Song of Songs, and it'd be lovely to see you all here. Thank you.